here to dive into industry trends with leading ETF experts. This is ETF Spotlight with Nina Mishra. Hello and welcome to ETF Spotlight. I'm your host, Nina Mishra. My guest today is uh, Zach's senior equity strategist and our resident real estate expert, Tracy Reinick. So we are talking about the housing market today. Tracy, welcome back. Uh, perfect time to talk about housing. We just got the de decision from the Fed and uh, they raised the rates by 25 basis points as expected, but suggested that this could be uh, the final rate hike in this cycle, right? So uh, it's a good time to talk about housing. So I wanted to start with these uh, housing doom predictions. Uh, so uh, we heard so many of uh, doomsters talking about uh, 2008 style crash and housing prices, and we never believed that. In fact, in fact, when we had you on the show uh, last year, we discussed that this housing market is very very different uh, from the one we saw in 2008. But I was still interested in your thoughts regarding those doomsters and why they were so wrong. Well, the doomsters are still out there, even despite yeah. <laughs> there being no doom right now. They're still waiting. They still expect the doom to come, but it, it's just not going to come in the way that they are thinking it's going to be. It's not going to be some huge crash. And I understand why so many people are kind of, you know, hoping or wishing that there would be some kind of big pullback because housing prices still remain really high and, it, and affordability is an issue. Um, so that's where the conundrum comes. If affordability is such an issue with the high mortgage rates now, uh, why is housing so you know holding up so well? And it really does come down to what we did discuss last time. And it is really all about the inventory. The inventory usually builds in the spring because that's when everybody wants to list their house. That's the, the main selling season for housing. And it just really hasn't happened this year. So it's still record low inventories. And that means there really can't be any price pressures because even though the number of buyers have declined to some extent, uh, some are just priced out and deciding to continue to rent or stay in their current home or whatever they were gonna be doing. Um, but it also means that there are still these other buyers who are out there and there just isn't there are just aren't enough homes so let's talk a little bit more about the state of the housing market as of now and um, home builders uh, have done pretty well this year in fact the home building builders etf uh, itb that is up about 23% year to date. Very impressive performance. And uh, home builder sentiment has improved now for three consecutive months. Home prices have been rising. As you mentioned, uh, they rose in March for the third consecutive month. New home sales are rising. And in fact, uh, inventory remains a big concern. And uh, CNBC was reporting yesterday that almost half of homes which are on the market are selling within two weeks. So yeah. as you mentioned, that uh, spring season is very important for housing. So what is your outlook for the spring housing market uh, as of now? Do you see any bright spots? Yeah, I mean, it, it's strong nationwide. It really hasn't slowed anywhere. Um, a little bit less of demand at the upper bracket, just because if you are taking out a mortgage at that bracket, then you, you're paying a lot more now. So some people have moved down a bit in the pricing, but the builders are able to do target pricing. They're able to, uh, you know, uh, lower prices in certain communities, in certain states, and not in others, depending on what's going on there with their competition with other home builders, plus the existing home sales competition. But normally, the existing homes, that's a much bigger market than the new homes. But 
uh, usually that is the home builders competition always every spring, but there's nothing coming on there. So suddenly the home builders are still basically in the driver's seat. It is a great place for them to be. If you listen to any of their conference calls this year or even ones they're doing recently for first quarter results or second quarter fiscal results for some of them, um, they're, they sound really bullish because uh, things have improved off of last fall. That's when the mortgage rates went above 7% and the whole whole housing market basically froze up. And you know nobody was coming into the sales centers for the home builders, but that has changed as those rates have come back down into the sixes. And then the home builders themselves have been buying the rates down. And so if they can get it into the fives, they've all been talking about how the buyers are adjusting to these higher rates now. You know, it hasn't been 3% or under for over a year now. And so this is the new reality and they are adjusting it, you know, with the monthly payment, what they're doing to get pre-approved, all of that. And they're still going out there to buy. Now, some of the home builders too have been adjusting their product. So they're, they can build smaller to keep the price down a bit on some of their um, homes. And so they're doing that. And then the home builders really kind of lucked out that some of the cost pressures they were facing have started to alleviate here with uh, lumber prices being down dramatically. That goes into the price of the home. They're saving a lot of money there. And then even just labor costs have eased off as well as some of the supply chain issues they were having. So when the supply chain improves, then the pricing pressures on that side of things also improve. So yeah, the home builders um, earnings are down off of last year. It was a record year last year, but that's to be expected. And sales are down 20 or 30%. But a lot of them are seeing a lot less cancellations now. The cancellation rates have started to come down. That's always a good sign for them. And that means the the buyers aren't panicking and they are able to make it work. So they're not rushing to just get out of the housing contract. And even if they do get out, the inventory is so low, even in existing homes, that they're able to resell that house pretty quickly, actually. So they themselves aren't able to sit on much inventory. And that's very different from 2008. We had like several million homes in inventory in 2008. And there's there's almost nothing right now. Yeah, you make uh, many good points. Uh, so uh, talking about home buyers getting used to this new reality. I think, you know, mortgage rates are come have come down a little bit, but home buyers know that they are not going to come down sharply. So they are getting used to this environment and preparing themselves to buy their home in this environment. Uh, and as far as uh, inventory is concerned, that is that is a big concern because existing homeowners don't want to sell, and uh, because right. they they took out their mortgages when rates were around uh, you know three percent, and uh, they don't want to um, buy another house at uh, at a mortgage rate of six or seven percent now. Uh, and uh, you also talked about low inventory that helps home builders because uh, now. I read that newly built homes are uh, making about one third of single family homes for sale currently because older older houses are not available at all. Yeah. Uh, so you talked about home builders earnings and many of those home builders reported recently in the past few yeah. days. Uh, is there any earning that you really liked or are there any key takeaways for investors? Uh, is there any home builder they should focus on now? Well, they're all basically about the same. If <laughs> you go in there and listen to them, uh, they're all still saying, as they've said, even throughout the pandemic, that the demographics are on their side. The millennials want to buy homes and they're the largest generation. Then we also have the baby boomers who are wanting to move, retire and move somewhere. So they also like to buy the new homes or they buy in the active adult communities. And so that's big demand on in that category. So 
the home players don't really see much change in these, you know, this situation for the next several years. So they're kind of sitting in the driver's seat. So it's hard to differentiate between all the home builders here, really, because uh, so many of them have. They all have the same story, and the national home builders are mostly in similar areas of the country, um, which means they're in the southeast. That's one of the big growth areas where everybody's moving, Texas, Florida. Um, to some extent, however, the the northeast is starting to pick up some steam, which some people might think, you know, wonder why. Because the story is that everybody's leaving the northern parts of the country for the south, but um, a lot of people deciding to return back or who were renting deciding they do want to stay in the north and are buying there too. So some of the home builders seeing some you know real strong demand in places like Massachusetts and New Jersey now. So my advice always is to be um, you know what's in your area where where do you think is you know the strong growth. Where is that home builder building? And then also differentiate between price points. So I do like Toll Brothers, uh, the only publicly traded pure luxury home builder. And so their prices go up to, I think, a little over $3 million on average. Uh, they also do have an affordable luxury is what they call it, around five, 600000 I believe, is what they're pricing that at now. But they're not for the first time buyer and they have a lot of cash buyers, which I like in this higher interest rate environment because the cash buyer doesn't care what the mortgage rates are. So that's important. So Toll Brothers, TOL is uh, one of my favorites, um, but you can also just kind of go down the line. If you're looking for a dividend, MDC Holdings pays the highest dividend in the industry. And I think it's almost 5% right now. The stock hasn't performed as well as some of the others, however. And I think some of that is because people tend to just buy the home builders of the, the major ones that they've heard of, like Lennar or Pulte or even Beezer, KB. These are like the bigger names. You know, Most people have never heard of MDC Holdings, but they make uh, Richmond American homes. If those are in your area, you probably have heard of them. Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, these bigger name home builders that might not be as uh, well known. And some of the ones I, I I do still also like the first time buyer, even with the mortgage rates at this level, because uh, the you know, home builders are able to buy it down, and that isn't stopping the even the first time home buyers in some of these key growth areas. So the southeast just isn't as expensive as what the west is. I would say with all the home builders, the west is getting hit the hardest. And one of the home builders that is big in the west is KB Home because uh, they started out there. So I would maybe stay away a little bit from. Some of the ones that are more heavily focused on the West where affordability is still an issue, uh, just those higher prices, the mortgage rates are impacting. But the builders that are big in like say Atlanta, Charlotte, Asheville, you know, Virginia, any of those areas, um, then affordability is still there. So I like a lot of those, uh, but most of the major home builders have some exposure to those areas. And uh, the state of Florida as well remains extremely hot, even though inventory is low and the price is is relatively high. But uh, one of the home builders said they're still seeing high wage earning individuals moving from like the north to these growth cities, and that is spurring uh, you know demand. And then the the higher price points they they can afford those those price points. So yeah, it's. Uh, it's kind of like maybe roll the dice and see what happens or buy the ETF. Right, right. So you talked about uh, some of the important local trends and we all know that real estate markets are basically local in nature. Yeah. Every market is very unique. And as you mentioned, the technology sectors in the West, they are struggling and 
that is because of these tech layoffs. And in fact, many yeah. had left uh, the Bay Area uh, during the pandemic. They, they left, sold their expensive houses and bought cheaper places elsewhere because they could work remotely. Yeah. Uh, New, New York, as you mentioned, uh, is seems to be coming back. Florida remains hot. Any other very interesting local trends you have seen that you would like to share? Not really, because it's all pretty much the same. Uh, while it does vary local, you know, market to market, and the price prices uh, will vary, you are seeing more price declines in certain of the more expensive markets, which makes sense. And then you're seeing, uh, you know, no price declines, or maybe even a little bit of an increase in areas like the Midwest, where it still remains affordable. And so there's not, and there's no inventory. So there's no, you know, price pressures there. So no, I would say the state of the housing market, pretty much a strong nationwide, maybe San Francisco is still one of the weakest, you know, the Bay Area in general, because of the high costs there and those mortgage rates and then the layoffs, as you said. So, um, and then maybe Seattle also due to layoffs and things and price point. But otherwise, um, no, <laughs> no, it's good. It's good everywhere. Okay. So we also should talk about commercial real estate. Um, this is an area of concern. And, uh, you know, in, uh, regional banks have a lot of exposure to commercial real estate. So that is why the regional banks are in a lot of trouble. And uh, Charlie Munger said recently that we have a lot of troubled office buildings, a lot of troubled shopping center, a lot of troubled other properties. There's a lot of agony out there. And when Munger or Buffett talk, we listen. So yeah. I was I was just interested in your thoughts on the state of commercial real estate market. And do you think we will see a lot of conversions in, from um, you know office buildings into apartments uh, going forward? I think on the office to apartments in certain cities where it's going to be possible to do so, then I do think we are going to see more of that. So in, say, for instance, Chicago's Loop, it's already uh, was converting old office buildings into apartments for over 20 years already. But this uh, situation where there's just no need for those offices anymore, and if there is need, the businesses want to be in new office buildings with the like the better wiring, the better gym space, and you know amenities. So that means they're leaving those older office buildings. So, but those older office buildings can more easily be turned into housing than the new ones, just the way that they were built, the smaller footprint, more windows, less interior space. But it's not exactly cheap to put you know, uh, plumbing and all that stuff into some of those. But I do think we will see uh, a decent number of those converted over. There's already a plan in Chicago called the LaSalle Street Corridor Plan, where um, the current mayor, Mayor Lightfoot, came to an agreement with one of the developers uh, that they've chosen to convert several buildings there into like, I think about a thousand apartments. And then bring in some more retail, like a supermarket and things, just to bring some more life back into the center of the cities. But not all cities will be able to do so. And that's what Charlie Munger is worried about. But it is also a worry on some like old hotels because people think, oh, nothing much happened with the pandemic. They all got, you know, loans, PPP loans. But some of those hotels were already struggling before the pandemic, and then they have been turning the keys to some older hotel properties, especially in urban areas, um, over back to the lenders. And we've also seen some more malls being turned over. But I do think on the suburban mall front, a lot of them are, that's a lot of uh, you know prime land. And a lot of them are being transformed over into like lifestyle centers, which means it has both retail and maybe like a movie theater or a farmer's market, and it has apartments all in one location. So that is kind of the, the next 
evolving of the mall. And any of the lenders uh, love that. Like, yeah, let's just convert it over into something else uh, because they don't want to get the properties back, right? They don't want to be the ones to have to deal with it. So we are already starting to see some extensions on loans that were coming due on commercial real estate. I've seen it on hotel side and some on office. So I do think some of the people who are really dark on commercial real estate that that may be overblown and it's not going to be as bad um, or it's going to take many years to play out, you know, five to 10 years for it all to be washed out. And so it's not some kind of, you know, uh, black swan event that happens because it takes so long to work its way through the economy. It's what I think is probably going to happen, but we'll see. Right, right. Yeah, we'll be watching that area closely. Um, you're right that uh, fears may be slightly overblown. Now, talking about the stocks that you like, you like Toll Brothers and yeah. uh, you like MDC. So I was looking at the performance. So MDC is up almost 30 percent year to date. Uh, Toll Brothers is also has also done quite well. It's up about uh, 25 percent year to date. Uh, so yeah. do you think uh, investors should look at these stocks uh, in the current environment or should they wait for some pullback? Do you think this is the right time to buy or uh, they have got up too much too soon? Well, home builder stocks do work in a cycle and people maybe have forgotten it now because it, it went away during the pandemic in the stocks. But usually the stocks have this thing called the hope trade and it trades start the stocks start going up uh, in the fall because there's hope for the upcoming spring season. And people are starting to think, oh, maybe it won't be as bad as we think or that kind of thing. So we have we saw that this year and the stocks have rallied. But usually by the summer, the spring buying season is over. We basically can see what's happened. We know how the summer is developing and the stocks either you know pull back a bit or basically tread water and don't go anywhere. But even many times they do pull back at that point, like the, the trade is done. And then you wait again until the fall for the next hope trade <laughs> for next year. So if I was looking to buy the home builders here, I would probably be still on the sidelines and waiting for a pullback in it um, because we're kind of you know heading towards summer now and that trade is basically done. But the stocks are really cheap here as on like a PE basis. So, um, you know, valuation isn't really the concern and earnings look pretty good. Even coming down off that record year, the analysts were too gloomy and they've had to uh, raise estimates after this earnings report because they were cutting too dramatically for this year. And the margins look really good. So things are still looking good, but I'm on the sidelines myself just waiting for more of a pullback. And if we start to see an actual recession, the home building stocks will, will really pull back in that, that scenario. Because the two things that you know formulate for the home builders are um, job market and mortgage rates. And we've adjusted to the mortgage rates, but if more people lose jobs in the next six months, they will continue to see slowing sales. Very helpful. So wait for some pullback. Yeah. Uh, now, if you want to look at ETFs, uh, there are two main home building ETFs. Uh, the larger one is by iShares. It is the iShares US Home Construction ETF. The ticker symbol is ITB. And uh, this basically tracks a market cap weighted uh, index. So it is top heavy. Uh, the biggest home builders, TR Horton, Lennar, NBR, and Pulte Group, they account for majority of the portfolio. And since all those stocks have gone up this year, the ETF is also up about 22% year to date. And uh, if you want to avoid that over concentration in the portfolio, then maybe look at the equal weighted ETF, the ticker symbol is X. 
H B. It is by State Street. And in addition to home builders, the CTF also has uh, uh, significant exposure to building products and home furnishing companies. Uh, so this is up about 15% year to date. Tracy, that was so much fun. Always enjoy discussing housing with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was great. I can't wait to the next time. Thanks for listening. If you like our show, please leave us a rating on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. Also, make sure to subscribe so that you do not miss any episode. If you have any comments, questions or suggestions, please email podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.